I think we're live. Hey, good morning, everyone. Or afternoon, depends on where you are. Excited to see everybody joining. everyone we're uh we're gonna wait a couple minutes for some people to join um i know with the time difference with a lot of people um it's a little uh it's a little tough maybe some people are getting off calls so we're gonna wait a minute or two um as people join but uh but welcome everyone i'm excited to see people in the chat uh, a lot of people that i've actually spoken with personally are in here so very exciting to see that and this is primarily q a so if you want to uh load up the chat with questions and um, mm -hmm. get us started. We'd be happy to, 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 to look at those first. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Wait in a few more minutes. I'm seeing some people are still logging in. Yeah, exactly as Brendan said, um, there is a Q&A panel on the left, um, just a simple little form. Um, if at any time uh, you all have a question, uh, feel free to submit it into there. We're going to get started and we're going to give it a little bit more time and then uh, we're going to get started. Maybe one more minute. Yep, I'm seeing people flood in. That's great. All right, we can probably go ahead and get started. So, um, like I said, good morning, everyone, or afternoon, you know, depending on where you're at. Um, I wanted to um, kind of start this off, just introduce um, everyone just a little bit. Um, I'm Jesse. Um, I'm Jesse Hollett with Linebridge, uh, and I'm, I'll be your host for today. Um, what I wanted to do first is I kind of wanted to show everyone around the dashboard real quick. Um, on the left, you can see, you know, us, me, in this case. And right below that, there is a Q&A section. So if any point in time, um, like we mentioned earlier, this is a live Q&A session and ask me anything. So if at any point in time you have questions, feel free to load them up in there and we will, we will cover them. Basically we'll interrupt whatever we're doing and cover them. Um, you'll see that there is um, some slides um, in, the, uh, in the middle of the screen. And, and on the right, there is action. Um, we have AI powered uh, captions uh, as well as uh, live translations powered by Interpify. So pretty, pretty interesting. Um, you guys feel free to play around with that uh, in whatever language you want. There is a, an audio section that will actually silence me and translate me live um, with, uh, translate my voice live, and also a caption settings that will do the same thing, but with uh, the written word. So use that tool. Um, if indeed, uh, you know, uh, you have a preferred language that you'd like to use, um, really interesting. Um, we're hoping to Take about 25 minutes for this. I know everyone's busy. Um, maybe some of you are doing this on your lunch break, but um, we uh, we will stay on for as long as necessary to get through the questions. So don't feel like 25 minutes is is all we have. Um, now the the other thing is is that at any point in time before or after the event, you can also reach out at seo at lionbridge.com, and that's going to reach Brendan, um, whom uh, we're going to introduce here in just a second, as well as myself. Um, to help, you know, route to any internal resources at Lionbridge that you need. Um, so this is the first uh, in a series of SEO webinars um, hosted by me and with uh, Brendan Walsh, um, who uh, I'm about to introduce. Now, a um, couple things. Um, many of you um, in this in this group um, have actually been like, <laughs> I don't want to say it like this, but kind of handpicked it, handpicked to be here. Uh, many of you are existing customers, and we have some new faces here too as well. So I'm really, really excited to see many of the the names and faces here, especially the people that I spoke with um, actually personally. So I'm very happy that you guys have decided to join us. If you are new to LionBridge, um, for the uninitiated, I guess, um, we are among the world's most uh, globally recognized localization uh, companies. Um, and so our goal sort of is to connect the world, right? And <clears throat> um, 
to do that, we kind of have to help some of the world's largest brands to connect the dots in search engines for the content that we localize so that it gets shown to the right audience, the right language at the right time. And doing that is, as I'm sure most people know, is really complicated. It's really complicated. So to orchestrate that dance, we um, actually have Brendan here. Um, and, uh, and Brendan, um, you know, uh, feel free to introduce yourself. Well, my name is Brendan Walsh. Um, I work in uh, Lionbridge, but out of Ireland. So, uh, of course, European and uh, American clients, global clients, really. Um, I really work, I suppose, trying to help our clients get the right page in the right market. So our clients are investing significant um, money with us with regards to content and making sure that that content lands in the right market and uh, performs in the right way um, for the right audience in that market um, would be kind of where I try to influence the process. So I am I go very deep on international and less deep on some of the technology, but um, regards to international, pretty pretty deep. And Brendan, how many? Already... <clears throat> Brendan, Sorry. just to go kind ahead, of tease you up a little bit, how, how many years of sort of international SEO experience would you say you have? Oh, only ten. Only, only ten, ten, Jesse. So. I've been in SEO for about 15 years, since, well, six, since 2008, and this now is my 10th year with Lionbridge. So I've been from day one, I suppose, in Lionbridge, focusing in on international SEO. But one of our, I started up with one of our major software clients in house for a year, understanding their SEO issues and understanding why, you know, they're US pages were dominating globally and that kind of thing and working out a solution for that. And that was my introduction, I suppose, to hreflang and, and, and geotargeting and understanding what can influence uh, getting the content to land in the right market. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah. And, you know, Brendan, uh, across, across a lot of the projects that you've sort of been asked to you know, speak on uh, at Lionbridge. You've worked with all sorts of companies. You know, airlines, what luxury brands. Can you talk about some of the yeah. some of the different types of companies and different types of, let's say, like CMS structures you've worked on? So I suppose for a lot of our um, customers, the ones that are really interested in in SEO are those that are selling online. So a lot of retail companies, as you say, airlines, um, automobile manufacturers. Um, software, um, hardware, and um, yeah, basically, you name it, um, it comes across the Lionbridge desk, and if it's global, if it's international, I've looked at the website and uh, analyzed the, 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 the impact of their geotargeting, their HF landing tags. Mm -hmm. So, um, I see we have a question there from Beth Kalich. Um, I've worked with before, actually. Um, Beth says, what are the benefits or drawbacks of using a subdomain versus a directory for separate country websites? And Beth, I can answer that quite quickly. I don't think there's really too many differences from a technical perspective. Well, from, a, from an SEO perspective, Google doesn't really mind if your content is in a subdomain or in a directory. I think from a management perspective, it's easier in a directory than in a subdomain. Subdomains are useful for separating out a site, but I prefer to use a subdom subdomain for separating it out from a functional perspective rather than from a language perspective. So for example, you could separate out like we have in Lionbridge, we have our games as games.lionbridge.com and within that then we have directories for the language structure. And that makes sense because at any stage in the life of a company, you could choose to hive off a certain function into a different company or sell it off. So that makes that separation easier. Um, but you're never really going to do that at language level, or maybe not at language level. So I think there's no actual benefit or drawback between subdomain versus directory for country websites, but I think um, directory is just easier to manage. 
if that yeah and, and kind of just to dovetail off that brendan aren't there some some mm -hmm. extra trouble that sort of comes in with with domains specifically especially if you've got a a large sort of like um web team where everyone's sort of you know the australian team is trying to do you know trying to default yeah, yes. their pages and you know the us team's trying to default their pages I think that comes down to when you've got really um, separate websites. So you've got a, you know, a local Australian website, you've got a local uh, uh, US website, but they're all in the one kind of company, even though they're on you know, separate countries, they're all the one company and they've the potential to impact one another unless, the, uh, unless they're kind of linked correctly using hreflang mm -hmm. tags. So that can happen, Jesse, a lot where you see, um, yeah, you might see an Australian uh, version of the site and the UK version of the site, a US version of the site, all implementing their own hreflang tags mm -hmm. and all uh, wanting to be the X default. I think that's the mm -hmm. issue that can, that can happen. There. A lot of the time, you see that kind of conflict coming up where um, hreflang is used incorrectly. It's used by the local site to define the language of the page rather than the relationship between pages. So you might see a single href line tag on a page, an English page maybe, and it says href line en. But within that company, you know, they may have 10 English pages and each of them says, hey, uh, you know, href line equals en. So obviously mm -hmm. there's a conflict there and you know that kind of is it does really does nothing for, for the website has no positive impact on, on on seo because google doesn't really pay attention to the href lang tag regarding the actual language of the page and um, it'll look at the content of the page to define the language of the page it even doesn't really use the lang tag at the top to define the, the, the language of the page so <clears throat> that's another issue that you, you'll frequently find where the href line tag and the actual language of the page don't match. Um, mm -hmm. but that's a separate issue. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I mean it gets really complicated. You know, it's 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 funny because um, especially if you know if some in the audience have come from, you know, perhaps just a national company and then have gone to an mm -hmm. international company, it, it's a completely new concept. You know, it's 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 a whole you know it's a whole you know can of worms that gets opened. You know, sorry to use the expression, but it, you know it, it really is um, you know complicated uh, to learn, and it can be um, really really messed up a lot, especially if you don't read the documentation, which apparently is a big issue. Well, yes, I mean you know if you don't read the documentation, well, you know you, there, there's only one person to blame, really. But I suppose I suppose most of us expect most of us expect that you know. You, it will be built into the CMS. That, that ability to yeah. do these things will be available within the CMS. And it's not available in the CMS. It is, you know, for the most part, you know, for the, you know, WordPress, it's, it is available, you know, with, with plugins and things like that. But, but from, 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 from most of the larger enterprise level CMSs, it's not built in. Um, mm. We've built our own solution for AEM. We've built our own solution for Sitecore when we were on Sitecore. Um, and yeah, and, and, and so it, it's not that difficult to actually build a, a HRF line solution once you know what you're trying to do. Um, but it, um, it's rarely done uh, correctly. And I think, you know, and, and I, I'm not a big slide person, Brendan, I don't think you are either, but um, you did go through the trouble of putting together really good, solid, you know, concise set of slides here. So I think it might be a good idea if we go through those and sort of just set sort of a broad stage sure. of, you know, international yeah. SEO, um, you know, just, you know, optimization uh, overall for people who, you know, maybe this is their first exposure to it. I think, I think for a lot of people, especially when you start getting into very, very niche marketing worlds and groups, people just sort of assume that you've come to the table with this information. And for some people, this could be your first exposure to it. Um, now, before we do that, um, there is, and I do want to acknowledge this, there is a question in the chat from <clears throat> Ashish, who says, how to set up multi-touch attribution for a complex system where there is a headless CMS and Adobe analysis and many ABM campaign scripts running on the site? That's a great question. This is a really great question. 
I, I'm not sure that it's, it's super SEO related right now. So um, I, I would say that it's it has a lot to do with whatever tech stack. I would start with the tech stack, you know, um, before you do anything. Um, but I'd, I'd love to answer that question. So I think I'm going to take that one offline. Um, and uh, is if it's okay, you know, I'd love to just kind of ping you on the side and, and talk with you about that because I love those types of questions. That's that's really really fun question. So just want to make sure that that you know uh, you know she saw that I, I had seen that question. Um, but I want to make sure that we can, you know, with our limited time, we can focus in on the the international SEO optimization side of things. So, um, so yeah, uh, Brendan, if you want to get started, you know, kind of giving us a a, a tour, a little, you sure. know, you know, walk around the park of um, international SEO, that'd be that'd be great. Okay, so what I did initially was just, you know, I I, I downloaded a few definitions from you know sources uh, that we would all know and trust, I suppose, Google, SEMrush, Ahrefs, uh, and Moz. Um, you can read away those those, those definitions. Uh, but I suppose uh, <coughs> hreflang is, is a really interesting and useful tool that allows you to define the multiple versions of a page for, you know, the different languages or regions. Uh, you need to be able to tell Google what page to land in what market, but not in every circumstance. So not every international website needs hreflang. If you've got a language-driven website with two or three languages, Google, for the most part, is going to land the right page in the right market. It's when the website gets a little more complex and you want to exert a little more control over how the website is seen. The next slide is one, my last minute.com slide. So I put this together today just to visually kind of help us understand how to use hreflang tags within the code. So <clears throat> we use hreflang tags at language region level. So for example, ENGB, ENUS. So within this visual example, we have a page for the UK, we have a page for the USA and they have their own instances. They'll usually be in a directory structure. We also, in this circumstance, could have a global fallback page for English. Now, on some websites, that could be pointing at the UK page or at the US page, usually at the US page. But sometimes it will have its own global implementation so that, um, so that Glo yeah, global English users have a page for themselves that doesn't have sterling or it doesn't have dollars or has just kind of a fallback uh, value. Um, <clears throat> you can also have just a language level tag. So you could have, we say, an F4 tag, just targeting global French users uh, with content that was relevant to them or just in that language. Um, you could have a situation where you have um, a page for specifically for German users, a page for other German speakers globally. And then what you can see in the middle there is X default. So X default represents the rest of the universe of your total addressable market that's not covered by any of these tags. So what I'm trying to express there visually is 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 quite a complex um, scenario, but broken down into something that, you know, looks kind of easy visually. Um, does that make sense, Jesse? Are we getting any more questions? Yeah, yeah, we actually have a really great, uh, really great question. Um, so, uh, hello, Henrique here, and hopefully I didn't butcher your name, uh, talking from Brazil. With an international website having the top three organic impressions and clicks, um, countries being Turkey, India, and then the US, um, and he says bigger slice from the two, but our biggest revenue country is the United States. How would you say we should optimize for the first two? So uh, Turkey and India, if, if I'm reading that correctly. Um, we still do not have much localized content for those countries due to services and product capabilities. Great question. In international and top three organic impressions countries being so top three organic impressions clicks countries being Turkey, India, and then the US. Okay. Bigger slide from the first two. But our biggest revenue country is the US. Okay. So 
are you seeing, I suppose, a lot of impressions, a lot of interest from those sites, but less conversions? Um, I suppose if 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 you're getting a lot of interest from those two countries and you're not getting conversions, it could be because your localized content, you don't have the services and product capabilities within those countries. So um, I'm not sure if this is an SEO problem or whether it's just do you have the services or products within that market or available for that market? So people do people have the ability to convert? Um, are you shipping to uh, Turkey and India as well as the US? Um, Enrique, give me a little more detail there and I'll try and, and try and be a little more uh, I'll try and be a little more uh, explicit with my answer. Yeah, and while we're waiting on an update on that, Brendan, I mean, I think that opens up a pretty interesting question where when you have limited capabilities or even limited time, you know, maybe a small team or, you know, you're trying something out, yeah. how do you figure out where to throw the dart first? Oh, well, um, I suppose there are tools available. We have access to a tool called the Global Revenue Forecaster, which is by CSA Research. And that allows us kind of put in financial information um, from the company and based on their kind of current languages, current markets and potential target markets, potential target languages, it comes up with via an algorithm that comes up with numbers that suggest, OK, you know, if you do Germany first, this is the total um, revenue you can potentially address in that market. Or if you do, we we'll say, French first, here's the revenue. So you can compare the two markets and make a decision based on, on, on data. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, I mean, a lot of it also depends on, on, on whether or not the, um, the company wants to go into the market too. So evaluating the market, understanding the market, and understanding the client's um, needs and requirements, and also is the audience there for that product or service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think that's a key part. I mean, for, for me at least, um, you know, I would say that um, if, if you're looking, if it's a problem where you don't have the content to begin with, um, then I would say mm -hmm. you're going to want to start with, you know, uh, where you're getting interest and where your target market is. Um, if you have a lot of buyers that are in India and you don't have India specific pages, you don't have Indi India specific content, it might make financial sense to make India specific content, right? So, I mean, I, I think it opens up a great question. Um, Henrique adds. Well, I think we did add. So, yeah. So, I think, Enrique, one of the things you could focus on is, I mean, well, is your is your content created for the U.S. market? And if it is created for the U.S. market, then should you focus on optimizing SEO? Well, if you want to supply into Turkey and India, if you've no problem supplying into Turkey and India, then I would do research. Do research in Turkey, in India. Particularly in India might be easier for you because India, you can also use English, although obviously using local languages will be better, but you can start out with English in India and kind of use your English for the US research as a starting point for your Indian research. So take you know the, the, the main keywords that have been successful in the US but use them as a starting point for research in India, not as kind of the end point as you, for your Indian research. And create dedicated uh, English content for that market. Um, look to questions research to see, you know, do people in India have the same questions about your product and service as they do in the US? When they're searching with, you know, particular terms, is the search intent the same? Do a little bit of manual research, go into uh, Google in India and um, put in those search terms, see what ter see what websites are coming up. Do they match what you're doing? And if so, you know, go down that route. But they might that might be quite different from 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 what's going on in the US. So if you're getting a lot of interest in Turkey and India, that you know, it might be useful. But also beware like that, you know, not all of that Turkish or Indian content wants to convert. They might be doing research, they may be doing things like mm. that. So you need to do a little bit of research to make sure that the audience yeah. is there, the the market is there, the revenue is there before you, you, you kind of um, make the decision to target. 
America says that's great insights. Thank you. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Um, you know, and, and I, I really do think that's a great question. Um, and and it's it's funny because it's not a question necessarily about international SEO optimization. It's more really a question of the the intent of the visitor of the site as well as the thought process that goes into why do you optimize this content to begin with? And if you can't optimize everything, where do you take a bite first? You know, if you've got a whale and you need to take a bite, which end are you taking a bite out of first? Um, so I, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I wonder, um, you know, ultimately th there is a, there is a, a part of this that is ROI focused, you know, you know, getting, mm -hmm. getting good content into a buyer's hands might make them more likely to purchase something. But I mean, ultimately a lot of this optimization has to do with the user experience. It may not even be a converting factor necessarily. It may just be that you're speaking the customer's language. Isn't that right? Yeah. I mean, my, I was, I was, I was, to be honest, uh, Jesse, I was more impressed just the fact that um, Enrique is looking at the data and trying to make decisions based yeah. on the data that he's seeing, you know, which is, I think it is, the, is, 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 is a great starting point from an SEO perspective. Let's start with the data, understand the data, understand your audience, where they're coming from, and then kind of, you know, make your decisions based on that. Um, so there are a couple of new questions coming in. Using a dynamic content for a landing page with an international campaign. I like Q2 there. As a multilingual content service provider, how should we promote international SEO techniques for clients focused on local SEO based on their industry or domain? So I'm not really sure. As a multilingual content service provider, um, I don't know. If well, some techniques are obviously going to be uh, interesting for you in a, in, in, in a local market. So if, for instance, you're targeting multiple languages within the one country, which I think is what, what a multilingual content service provider, how should we promote international is for clients focused on local mm -hmm. SEO? So I presume this is a multilingual local SEO page. Well, multilingual <coughs> local SEO is still interesting from a, I mean, I think from a hreflang perspective in some respects, because from a hreflang perspective, um, you can use it to control with say, how people who don't use any of the local languages that you're targeting are treated. So, you know, you can use X default for your fallback page, but you can also make sure that if there's any ambiguity between different variations of different languages that you're trying to serve on the same site that you know once the language codes exist uh, you know with them once the iso language codes exist then you can use hreflang to make sure that the right pages are being served to the right people um but you know i mean I'm, I, I, if if a client is focused on local seo most of the time they're going to be focused on a single language a lot of the time um, although, you know, that's not always the case, obviously, in, in, in the US, you're going to have English and Spanish. In, 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 in Europe, we have multiple countries that have more than one official language. So um, in reality, international SEO techniques are used within those countries all of the time to make sure that, you know, Google understands what pages for what user. Does that make sense? Yes, it, it, uh, no. yeah. It's all great questions. Yeah, and you know he he had a two parter there too, so you know he's he's he very interesting. So SEM would not necessarily be my main um, my main uh, skill set, but I can see the benefits and the drawbacks of using uh, dynamic content for landing pages within international campaigns, because I think we'll get there. I think with um, AI we we'll move forward and be able to do more complex things from a mm -hmm. dynamic content perspective. But I think at the moment, dynamic content, if you're spending money on getting somebody to land on a page, I want that page to be very, very tailored for the audience that is at, that, that I'm targeting. So dynamic content can be very beneficial, but it can also be um, very generic and not very specific. So 
It depends, I suppose, on the quality of the end page. We are to know whether it's dynamic or not dynamic. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think for that, I mean, I, I think that's a broader conversation too, because it's, it's not just involving, you know, HF Lang or, you know, really any of the other things that go into, you know, international SEO uh, optimization necessarily. It, it can involve them. You know, if you have the existing structure, if you've done a good job, you know, like, um, you know, like Brendan has said, with, uh, you know, with your site structure and 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 with, with defaulting your content and, and, you know, making sure that you have these these you know audience specific variations, then you can lean on that with your search engine marketing, you know, with your paid media. Um, but I, I mean, I would say from a dynamic perspective, you know, um, I, I wouldn't say that. I would say that you have lots of other tools at your disposal that you know um, are maybe a little bit you know more specific campaign specific, right? So like if you're using Adobe Target or you're using you know Pardot or or something like that, and you know, you're able to, you know, create that user profile and, and really personalize that content, then, you know, absolutely do that. Um, but, uh, you know, but also lean on, um, you know, on uh, hreflang for uh, for when customers come to your site from Google, for sure. But uh, yeah, great, great questions. Um, well, I think dynamic content is probably going to get very interesting over the next year or two. I think, yeah. um, you know, AI is going to have a significant impact on our ability to serve up dynamic content and personalize that content um, at scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, we're coming up to the to the end of the to end of the time here. So uh, I understand if some people have to drop. Um, Brendan, do you want to do you want to go through the rest of your slides for people? Because there's a lot of people who are going to be watching this recording, um, so that you can actually go through and set that foundation. And and we still got time for more questions. I think. Um, <laughs> if if the interest is there, um, we can go to slide five. So, can we live without it? Is it necessary? So, hreflang is an interesting concept, but it's not always necessary, on, even on international sites. If you've got, we say, a two-language site, like I was looking at a, a site today with English and Chinese, in general, Google is going to know what page to show to everyone. You know, it, in general, they'll probably show English pretty much globally for anyone who doesn't speak English or Chinese. But Google will, you know, will, won't. You won't have competition between pages. Let's say if you're not, if your site is not using multiple versions of the same language. So in, in, that's kind of an expansion of the first point. So if you've got five languages, but you know, they're all unique languages, there's no overlap, you're not trying to serve up two English pages, Google will usually display the right page. But not always. Okay, so <clears throat> on the language-driven site, it's not always needed, but it can be useful. So if, for example, you've got five languages on the website, um, hreflang gives you the ability to define which of those pages shows up to people who don't speak any of those five languages using your X default tag. So that can be useful even on a language driven site. So it's not always necessary, but it is always nice to have. And um, it is necessary if you're targeting multiple regions with the same language and separate pages. Um, frequently sites will need multiple instances of a page for different countries because of currency, delivery options, uh, different product options, different services, uh, product availability. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, these pages are almost duplicate. So hreflang is necessary mm -hmm. for Google to understand, you know, which page to show. Google will not interrogate your URL to, to look for language codes as hints as to what page to show in any market. It will probably do it based on backlinks, based on shares, based on things like that. So in those circumstances where hreflang is not implemented, you know, the fact that the US page or the page in the parent market is probably the one that's most used, the one that's most shared, the one that's on social media the most, that's the page that will win if hreflang tags um, aren't applied. Um, if you've got pages which are actual duplicates, and I see this in a lot of hreflang implementations, mm -hmm. then reconsider your strategy, okay? 
you don't need duplicate pages or you shouldn't need duplicate pages. Um, they may evolve because you've needed separate uh, instances because of currency and things like that. So you can sometimes have duplicates, but where you have duplicates, please review it. Google doesn't like to be indexing duplicate content where it doesn't need to. Um, so, uh, and I wanted you to finish that slide because that that's very, very important. You know, it's, it's even reading the documentation, um, you know, because uh, not everyone, of course, is exposed to um, hreflang and, and sometimes when they do they just go and they read the documentation e even reading that i didn't pick up on that you know and maybe they spelled it out maybe i just didn't read very clearly but that's a really important slide and I, i'm glad that you got a chance to show that but um we did get one more question from ashish and this one's a this one's a really good one um i really really like this one um are there any niche seo tools that help with keyword research for non-english languages simrush hrefs mm -hmm. have stats on searches from from specific geographies, but wanted to know if there are any other ones that are good. And I, I, Brendan, I think this is right up your alley. <laughs> well, this is right up my alley, but I have to say we have focused on SEMrush um, for a long time. Um, we have you know, a, an understanding with SEMrush. We've got a good uh, situation where we kind of just, um, we have two sets of licenses. We've got Guru license for our 10 kind of core users. But we've also got a, a ton of um, keyword research only licenses, which they've evolved for us. And so I, I have to declare that straight up. You know, <laughs> we have we are a sandwich house. So, and I'm not saying that you know it's better or worse or anything like that. But it's been very good for us. Ahrefs is excellent, and they're all there's loads of other good tools out there. There's other tools and um, keywords.io that will look at things like. Um, like uh, Apple Store and Chrome Store and things like that and give you keyword research from that. So that can be very useful. And um, the other thing that I have found useful recently, um, once again, is actually artificial intelligence. So we were asked to come up with keywords um, outside of fully supported languages and through some kind of, um, yeah, I suppose, decent um, prompt engineering, we were able to get AI to do keyword research in what were then unsupported languages. But obviously, Google has come out now uh, from a translate perspective with a whole load of new languages that it's supporting uh, based on um, AI capabilities, I presume. So what I would suggest is, and I wouldn't suggest any specific, but I, you know, obviously, the Google tool is probably a good one to, to use from a keyword research perspective. But yeah, I would suggest um, exploring AI um, for those geographies because AI has a lot of information in it that we really <laughs> don't even know about. You know, it's been trained on the internet. And so if your language is on the internet and you're looking for ideas, ways to start good ideas and good, good starting points for SEO research in any market. I think AI is a really good starting point. And, you know, it's most of the tools are free. And if they're not free, they're reasonably cheap compared to some of the SEO tools. So I would suggest starting with AI, verifying on, you know, anything that you get from AI with other tools to make sure that the information is good. We all know that AI can hallucinate frequently um, and, 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 and some of the keyword research out of AI can be quite very interesting um, and very kind of long tail rather than, you know, focused, but definitely worth exploring. And I probably went on a little bit long about that. No, I mean, it's a, it, it's a great question. It's a great answer. And, you know, funny enough, um, Ashish, that actually dovetails into our uh, uh, next webinar. Um, so I, I, for those who, you know, have to run, um, I do, I have a couple, you know, quick things. I really appreciate everyone's questions. We got a lot of questions. Um, Ashish, you had that first question. I, I want to reach out to you via email and answer that. I really like that question. I think it's a great question. I think a lot of people have that one. So, you know, I, I, I'd love to help you with that. Um, but our next uh, webinar in this SEO series, specifically, it's funny that she, we're, we're you know, likely ending with that question. Um, the, it, the topic is automating SEO with AI. 
And so that's going to be on the 18th of September. Um, and, you know, if, if anyone's interested, you know, I, I'm going to send out the, uh, the recording link um, as well as, uh, you know, the slide deck at the end of, uh, you know, sometime today, you know, probably a little bit later in the day. I know everyone has probably got to, you know, run and has some things to do. But um, I will send out the recording as well as the, uh, the, the slide deck um, later today. And I'll also send out that reminder and, uh, you know, we'll invite um, everyone who was in attendance to participate on that one as well, because on top of being an expert in uh, international SEO, Brendan, um, you know, I, I don't want to toot your horn that much. I should, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, give you a big head or anything like that. But Brendan is also, uh, he knows Python as well as uh, is an AI expert as well. So um, uh, at Linebridge, of course, we have a lot of AI resources here. You know, we are, uh, we do employ all sorts of AI technology in our solutions, uh, especially client facing ones and internal ones. Um, so Brendan is, uh, he, he's got a lot of support behind him. So um, <clears throat> as far as AI is concerned and has had the chance to experiment with AI specifically um, on all sorts of projects. So I'm really excited about that next section, uh, next session. Um, uh, Brendan, I, I really appreciate all your time today. I think unless we get a question in, I, I think I'll, I'll give everyone back the, you know, minus 11 minutes or, you know, whatever, <laughs> how much we went over. Can I just, but, um, I know you're going to answer Ashish's question. If anyone else wants access to that answer, Jesse, how can they get it? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you can actually email us at SEO at lionbridge.com. Um, and, uh, yeah, just 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 ask us for that answer if anyone is interested, or you can just throw it into the chat right now into the Q and A if you're interested in that question. And just to highlight that one again, how to set up multi-touch attribution for a complex system where there is a headless CMS and Adobe analysis and many ABM campaign scripts running on the site. And so she should ask that. That was his first question. Um, not super relevant to this discussion, but a really great question um, and one that I'd, I'd love to help answer. So. Um, yeah, so uh, feel free to throw that in the chat if you're interested in that question or to email us at seo at lionbridge.com. And at any point in time, y'all can email that. That is no problem at all. We are happy to help you with anything, even if it's just quick questions. Um, but with that, I, I really appreciate everyone joining. Um, we love doing AMAs um, and we're a very approachable team. So if ever you guys have any international SEO questions or with the next session, um, automating SEO uh, with AI, any AI related questions, we'd be happy to help. But um, everyone, I appreciate everyone's time and uh, you know, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much, everybody.